So over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all so much for being here. It's also my first talk uh, after yeah over two years. So I really appreciate appreciate this. Um, this is my second book project and very much work in progress. So any feedback, comments, ideas, very welcome. Um, let's start with these two quotes. Um, first one. Of all the former colonial powers, we are probably the nation which has been happiest to shed light with no concessions or taboos on our past history in Africa. Um, and the second one, we note with concern the public monuments and memorials that are dedicated to King Leopold II and Foss public officers, given their complicity in atrocities in Africa. The working group is of the view that closing the dark chapter in history and reconciliation and healing requires that Belgians should finally confront and acknowledge Leopold II's and Belgium's role in colonization and its long-term impact on Belgium and Africa. In February 2019, the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent published a 74-point report on the conclusion of its official visit to Belgium the same month. While the first 11 points highlight governmental, institutional and grassroots initiatives to combat racism and hate crime and to promote the cultures of African diasporas, notably Congolese, the report unambiguously concludes that, quote, despite the positive measures referred to above, the working group is concerned about the human rights situation of people of African descent in Belgium who experience racism and racial discrimination, end quote. As the quote, on the slide illustrates, the report establishes a clear and direct link between these levels of racism against people of African descent in Belgium and the country's inadequate dealing with its own colonial legacy. This statement represents a stark contrast to Louis Michel's verdict, the first quote on the slide, a few years after he led the 2000-2001 inquiry, which, as Matthew Stannard puts it, quote, led to an admission of state complicity in Lumumba's death, referring to Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister of the independent Congo. Um, this inquiry was triggered by the publication of a popular history book, Ludo de Witte's The Assassination of Patrice, of Patrice Lumumba from 99. Stannard remarks how other author, authors, such as Adam Hochschild, who wrote King Leopold's Ghost, which is probably the most widely read work of popular history, on the so-called Congo Free State, quote, have at least insinuated that Belgians chose to forget or deliberately ignore their past overseas rule, whereas, as we will see, attention and support actually ramped up during the last decades of Belgian colonial rule in Central Africa. Since the end of World War II and the independence of what is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda and Burundi in 1960, Brussels has attracted migration not only from its former colonies in Central Africa, but also from Morocco due to bilateral labor migration agreements in 1964 and from other regions of the world with a history of French colonialism, as well as from Southern Europe. The Belgian capital today is home to significant diasporic communities. In 2013, 2.6 million people in Belgium were of non-Belgian origin, representing 24% of the overall population, and in comparison, Britain's migrant population amounts to 13%. What is more, debates in Belgium, in Belgium concerning the colonial period and its commemoration are closely tied to visual representation, as highlighted by the reopening in December 2018 of the Royal Museum of Central, for Central Africa, now rebranded as the Africa Museum in Tavuren, which is a suburb of Brussels in the, um, in the pro province of Flemish Brabant, after five years of renovation. The institution, previously known as the Royal Museum for Central Africa, initially erected as the uh, Palace of the Colonies at the Brussels International Exhibition of 1897, um, Oh, it was erected to advertise Leopold II's civilizing mission. There will be a lot of, I can't see that in the recording, but there will be a lot of inverted commas in this talk. Um, so it was to advertise this and uh, business and investment opportunities in the so-called Congo Free State. Leopold had appropriated the vast colony at the infamous Berlin Conference a few years prior, 
and would remain its absolute ruler until it was formally turned into a state-run colony in 1908 and renamed the Belgian Congo. Following international outcry in the wake of the publication of the atrocities committed as part of the colony's forced labor system, which together with imported diseases caused the death of an estimated 10 million Congolese over its only 23 years course of existence. And, um, but if you actually look at um, kind of the, the legal terms and the, um, uh, like what happened in this transition from kind of absolute monarchy to state-run colony, it wasn't actually that much that changed. Like the king still had a very powerful position in all of this. Um, but let's go back to the museum for now. So in 1898, following the World Fair, the Palace of the Colonies became the Museum of the Congo with a permanent exhibition and extended by a larger building which was finished in 1910, a year after Leopold's death, and named the Museum of the Belgian Congo. This larger building was necessary to house its ever-growing collection, stolen or otherwise appropriated, and from its inception to the present day, the museum has been involved in archival work and scientific research, which is something I will come back to later. What has often been described as Europe's last unreconstructed museum of the colonial era had undergone a process of self-proclaimed decolonization, um, quote unquote, through its 66 million euro renovation that was carried out between 2013 and 2018. However, as numerous critics and activists have already denounced, this undertaking remained eventually insufficient. For instance, as historian Donald Hassett explains in a recent article, and that's the, the quote here, the museum's decolonization, it was argued, must not comprise its fundamental mission of representing, explaining, and even commemorating Belgium's colonial past. Thus, for all the efforts of senior administrators to frame the renovation as a project of decolonization, from the outset it was clear that there were limits on the institution's willingness to reimagine itself and the stories about the past and present it aspired to tell. Taking a lead from Hassett for this paper, I would like to propose moving away from discussions of very obviously um, culturally sensitive objects, such as statues, human remains or photographs, Although I've realized that um, I will end up talking about a specific statue after all later on. Um, in the interest of time, I would just like to draw your attention to these two articles by Cecile Bishop and Ka um, Kaya Davis Hayon that engage with the topic um, very thoroughly. So if um, kind of the, uh, the visual side of things is, is more what you're interested in. Instead, I would like to open up the discussion of the extensive representation of natural sciences in the museum space, especially of botany and zoology, and how they form central elements in its narrative of quote-unquote decolonization. For this, I'm proposing that it's important to take into consideration Imperial Belgium's extensive history of representing sciences through exhibitions at museums and world fairs. And for this, I would like to um, quickly focus on a single case study, the so-called um, Expo 58, so the Expo 58, the first World Fair held after the end of World War II, hosted in Brussels from April to October 1958, to provide some context of historical continuity for my interpretation of how the African Museum in particular depicts natural sciences but also to get a better understanding of the techno and biopolitical aesthetics of these representations. As Stannard explains, um, the 1958 World Fair was the last one in a longer series of 12 World Fairs hosted in Belgium since the first one in Antwerp in 1885. He argues that the significant sections of the exposition dedicated to Belgium's colonies, the Congo and what was, what was then called Rwanda Urundi, and which was a League of Nations mandate since the end of the First World War and which was previously part of German East Africa, eventually, quote, failed in its intentions to develop interest and sympathy in Belgium um, for the nation's Central African Empire, end quote. In doing so, he's, in, he's referring to an important aspect of Belgian colonialism, unlike it was the case, or probably still is, with French colonialism. There was never 
kind of all-pervasive sense of the country being the center of a colonial empire, which was due to a variety of reasons, which I won't address in detail here, but um, I, I'd be very happy to respond to any questions in the Q&A, such as the uh, very limited migrations of people between um, the colonies and mainland Belgium, and the country's internal linguistic, social, and political divides and the shifting power relations between the Flemish-speaking north and the French-speaking south of the country. However, the superficial quote-unquote lack of interest should not in any way signify that coloniality did not, not pervade many aspects of social life in Belgium in one way or another. Public museums and exhibitions thereby emerge as a privileged space of interaction between state power and citizenry, and like Expo 58, represent pivotal moments in Belgian collective memory of the uh, 20th century and provide insight into the politics and ideologies underli sorry, underlying the Belgian state self-representation to itself and the wider world during the last few years of European colonial occupation in Africa. Indeed, Dennis Poole describes, quote, world fairs as moments in which international diplomacy, science, and technology converge on a global stage. The 1958 World Fair, the focus of my first part of my talk, included the inauguration of the Atomium, um, today still one of Brussels' major landmark buildings, erected to celebrate the advent of the peaceful use of nuclear power. Only 14 years after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. From its inauguration to the present day, the atomium is clearly marked as a national monument, so um, also visually. So, for example, I'm not sure if you can see it here, no, I can't see it here, but um, there's always a Belgian flag hoisted on top of it. And the official website that you can see here um, asks for donation for quote unquote our national symbol. So, firmly tying the representation of support and pride in scientific quote unquote progress and quote unquote modernity um, to a narrative of Belgian national unity. The same World Fair also featured a quote unquote village indigène in the Congolese section, the so called Congorama perhaps more aptly described as a human zoo, where a group of Congolese men, women and children in quote-unquote traditional garment were put on show every day. As Dennis Paul again clarifies, quote, this quote-unquote peaceful use also implies underlying colonial networks because it necessitates the geopolitical management of uranium resources, end quote. And after all, it was uranium from Congo's Shinkulokwe mine that was used in the Hiroshima bomb. This coexistence of the celebration of scientific advancement embodied by the Atomium and the presence of a quote-unquote human zoo that stages the dehumanizing oppression of the colonized as a spectacle for a white Belgian audience, I argue, must be considered as inextricably connected. So they're not just happening there by chance that they're both happening there at the same time. This is all part of the same development. Their coexistence expresses a worldview that not only relegates the colonized into a quote-unquote subsection of humanity, cut off from post-war advancement and prosperity, and a war the imperial powers had also extensively fought on the African continent. Or, as Paul describes it, quote, Congo and Congolese people were st strategically displayed as quote-unquote backward and quote-unquote pr primitive in stark contrast to a high-tech modern domesticity powered by Congolese uranium, end quote. But that considers coloniality, so this, this, this whole kind of this coexistence of the two, um, considers coloniality as its foundational condition. This is also expressed visually um, when we look at a map of the World Fair, where the atomium, so that's the, uh, the orange thing here, is um, placed right next to the Congolese section. So the Congolese section is this, this whole bit here. So they're, they're, they're also right next to each other, horrifyingly so. Um, so coloniality and what Gabriel Hecht 
has termed nuclearity in her article, A Cosmogram for Nuclear Things, thereby go hand in hand. What things make a state nuclear? What makes things nuclear and how do we know? The degree to which and purpose for which a nation, a program, a technology or a material counts as nuclear is not always a matter of consensus. Nuclearity depends on history and geography, science and technology, bodies and politics, radiation and race, state and capitalism. It is not so much an essential property of things, it is um, distributed in things, and I'll come back to this in a second. What I'm trying to do in this larger project that this paper forms, uh, forms part of is to understand Belgium's scientific and nuclear imperialism, not so much as an ideology of catching up with um, Europe's more established colonial powers such as Britain and France, a common trope in, in the historiography of Belgian colonialism, but rather as an attempt at a nation-building project. So keep in mind that Belgium at this point had only become a state in its own right in 1830 after independence from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So by a time that the other colonial powers in Europe already had established their empires. And in particular, an attempt at presenting and representing itself as an, explicit, as an explicitly quote-unquote modern nation and a quote-unquote modern colonizer who had moved on from the um, atrocities of the so-called Congo Free State. In his critique of Black Reason, Achille Mbembe shows the connections between the Enlightenment era and the peak of the transatlantic trafficking of enslaved Africans. For example, by drawing on philosophers such as the German Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, who explicitly deny black humanity. I'm still very much at the beginning of thinking through this, um, so, so please bear with me, but um, I think it's possible to trace an iteration of this thinking. Um, in the ongoing employment of colonial era ideologies of justifying imperialism through quote unquote scientific progress. For example, in the renovated space of the Africa Museum, and I will start talking about the museum in a second. But um, Hecht's insistence on of nuclearity's dis distribution in things rather than um, considering it a property of things, then appears particularly fruitful within the context of the museum in order to discuss its representation of objects and the spaces it creates. Most critics of the museum's self-proclaimed decolonization process um, have so far focused on how the museum has dealt with some of its most obviously problematic items. I'll show you one. Um, such as uh, Paul Vissert's infamous 1913 statue of the Leopard Man. Um, the figure inspired the character of Muganga in Hergé's equally racist Tintin in the Congo and also forms the central focus of Congolese, Congolese artist Chiri Samba's painting Reorganisation, which was commissioned by the um, museum itself and which uses the statue's recognition value in, in order to illustrate the debates and problems of coming to, term, uh, of coming to terms with Belgium's colonial past and post-colonial presence. The Leopard Man now forms part of a selection of exhibits in a small room at the very beginning um, of a walk through the museum. So you enter the museum, you go through this long white corridor, um, there, there was a picture at the beginning um, with, this, with this long boat in it. And um, so you, you come in and there's a little room to your left, which is this room that you can see on the bottom left there. Um, so the Leopard Man forms part of a selection of exhibits in a small room at the very beginning of a walk through the museum, um, which serves to explain to the visitor their removal from the permanent collection and the museum's critical stance on colonialism. I'd be very much interested what you think about this curatorial decision in the Q&A, because um, I think while these problematic items do not remain in the main space of the museum, they're still being exhibited in this way. And I think this beckons the question whether this then constitutes a continuation of unresolved coloniality. What struck me during my pre-pandemic visit in August 2019, however, are both the spaces that have remained seemingly undisturbed by any decolonization attempts and the overwhelming space that has been created 
for the representation of sciences and scientific research, um, foregrounding the museum's role as one of the world leading research institutions for Central Africa. Have a look at this plaque, for instance. So I need another drink. So it reads, the museum's publications reflect the evolution of scientific research. In the colonial era, African cultures were often classified and described on the basis of racial theories. Nowadays, scientists want to know how people themselves give meaning to, the, to their lives. New techniques such as molecular analysis have major implications for the descriptions of plants and animals. The museum scientists now publish more frequently internationally and online, also in collaboration with African colleagues. End quote. And while the nature of the wall-mounted medium might account for the rather confusing co uh, collapsing of, Af um, of academic disciplines, from anthropology, a discipline wrestling with its colonial roots, especially in, um, uh, in Belgium, to molecule analysis, a laboratory procedure used, uh, used in genetic analysis, to botany and zoology, there's no specific mention of Belgium or any of its former colonies. And perhaps even more strikingly, quote unquote scientists and even the museum's scientists here are implied to be Europeans or at least Westerners. While quote unquote Africans seem to have graduated from research objects to quote unquote colleagues, their collaboration is framed within the context of the Western academic publishing industry, which as we all know, provides little to no access for researchers from the so-called global south. In any case, what I, I think this very brief um, text indicates is a broader issue of decolonization efforts in that it shows that a rethinking of methodologies is not enough, but that the colonial era system and its institutions itself must be tackled in order to generate genuine change. What is more, while the museum here addresses um, issues of epistemological violence, the removal of exhibits and the quote-unquote retelling of the museum's understanding of itself does not seem to extend to its representation of the non-human world as the so-called, oh, I'll come back to this in a second, um, as the so-called crocodile room demonstrates, um, the presentation of which still very much anchored in 19th century curatorial aesthetics, including the central positioning um, of two stuffed West African crocodiles, who are uh, also a critically endangered species. Um, and then in, in, the, in the back over there, um, uh, animal bodies preserved in alcohol and pinned butterfly displays. Um, so around there, the back, all around the back. Um, and pinned butterfly displays on the wall against the background of a rather kitsch wall painting of uh, what looks like a sunset on Lake Kivu or Lake Tanganyika. These issues, together with a sense of, and, and yeah, I, 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 when I was in there, I found it quite difficult to imagine what someone thought decolonization must look like in this room, because this still looks very much like um, it had been all the time before. These issues, together with a sense of excluding natural sciences, like biology and zoology, who seem like if they are some, somehow neutral um, from decolonize, so the exclusion of these um, of these disciplines from decolonization ex, um, efforts also extend to the museum's digital space, um, as the follow as the following video shows. And um, I apologise, it's a bit long; it's about three minutes. But um, since the museum also functions to this day as a contemporary research institute, I think it's important to give some space to um, the researchers' voices. And uh, we first hear from uh, Jean-Omar Sombo Chonda, who is a political scientist, and then from Marc de Maia, who is a, who is a biologist. And um, that's uh, also a break from me. <laughs> um, the numbers of competences that we find in the Museum Royal of Africa Central Nécessite néanmoins d'être associé aux compétences locales au Congo, car n'oublions pas que les données rassemblées au Musée Royal de l'Afrique centrale ont généralement une même source, la source coloniale, la source européenne. 
Aujourd'hui, il s'avère nécessaire qu'on ajoute les informations venant des acteurs vivant les événements sur le terrain. Pour cela, à partir de 2006, suite à la décision prise par la République du Congo avec la promulgation de sa nouvelle constitution, de recréer, de redémarrer euh, la décentralisation en créant ainsi une nouvelle province, il s'est avéré nécessaire d'associer les connaissances, les compétences, la quantité de données qui se trouvent au Musée Royal de, de l'Afrique centrale avec les connaissances qui sont au Congo, malheureusement des connaissances de plus en plus au moins qui restent de plus en plus orales. Donc, dans le cadre du projet province, il y a des équipes dans les 26 provinces, dans les 26 provinces agréées, qui en contact, en relation avec le Musée Royal de l'Afrique centrale, conduisent à la rédaction d'une série de travaux qu'on appelle les monographies de province. À l'instant, sept monographies sont déjà achevées et des volumes sur la décentralisation, c'est-à-dire qui portent sur les réflexions générales, euh, sont déjà terminés et publiés par le Musée Royal de l'Afrique centrale. Even onze hoofdactiviteiten is het beschrijven van de biodiversiteit in Afrika, de verscheidenheid van planten en dieren die men daar vindt. Daarvoor worden ze niet georganiseerd naar Afrika en ik denk dat materiaal terug naar het museum is. Dat is zo sinds het begin van het ontstaan van dit museum. En het 19e eeuw, begin 20e eeuw, werden grote expedities georganiseerd. Er werd een massa materiaal teruggebracht, waaronder veel nieuwe soorten voor de wetenschap. Deze zorgen werden dan beschreven en tot op vandaag hebben wij twee referentiepunten daarvoor. Dat is het origineel materiaal, dat men noemt het hypermateriaal, en de originele beschrijving. Dikwijls werden deze beschrijvingen dan ook gepubliceerd in de tijdschriften in de annalen van ons museum. En men kan zien dat vooral in het beginjaar van de 20e eeuw er enorm veel publicaties verschenen die uitsluitend nieuwe soorten beschrijvingen hadden. Uh, als men vandaag een nieuwe soort moet, dan moet men teruggrijpen naar die originele bron, het type materiaal op de originele beschrijving, om te kijken of wat men vandaag vindt verwant is, dan wel verschillend van wat men toen vond. En dikwijls is het type materiaal verdwenen, of ongelukken, door brand of andere problemen, en heeft men enkel alleen de originele beschrijving mogelijk gevallen. Vandaar dat die originele beschrijvingen zo belangrijk zijn voor ons in ons wetenschappelijk werk. So um, I think what I found quite interesting about this is um, that on the, on the one hand, um, the first speaker, Chonda, there is a certain sense of trying to rethink at least methodologies, you know? So he's talking about, he's talking about the colonial source, what he calls the European source, and that kind of other, other expertise or the expertise that previously has just been the research object, now deserves to be heard, deserves to be um, taken part of. I do kind of, um, I think it's a bit of a missed opportunity that it's then turned into monographs as well, like in a kind of, in a, in a Western European form of collecting knowledge and kind of not just as oral history. But um, I think there is, a, there is a clearer sense of what where a starting point could be to change the narrative however what i thought then in, in comparison to that with with demaya it's quite interesting there's like virtually no critical engagement with the collection including plants and animals and um that that there is no sense of any kind of um decolonization of the of the non-human collections of the museum and um finally and this is i i want to end on this point. Um, while much space is given to laud the achievements of Western science, African or Congolese science and innovation has no dedicated room, except for one solely dedicated to a traffic robot from Kinshasa. So that's uh, over here, this is the robot. Um, the, 
uh, democratic, um, uh, yeah, Kinshasa, the DRC's capital. While there remains a lot more to say, I hope I've been able to show with these brief examples how the Africa Museum's exhibition of its science collection casts African knowledge production as primarily concerned with local issues, such as the traffic in Kinshasa, as opposed to Belgian slash Western attempts of tackling problems, problems of global concern, such as the eradication of, of diseases, um, as evidence for a failed attempt at decolonization. A few days ago, a proposal, for, uh, a proposal for a new law that would enable the restitution of colonial collections was approved by um, the Belgian Council of Ministers, which, as um, historian uh, Sarah von Burden evaluates on Twitter, is something that is, quote, far from perfect, but also, quote, a big step forward, and something that would have been unthinkable about five years ago. It remains to be seen whether this discussion will extend beyond the very obvious. So thank you very much and I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Let me just stop the recording if I forget.